Welcome to easements part two. So far we have defined an easement, compared it to a license, and we discussed what an express easement is, an implied easement by prior existing use, and an easement by necessity. So now we are going to go ahead and discuss, um, we're gonna start off by discussing an exercise that reviews some of the concepts that we have covered previously, and it is on page 703. Suppose that R owns two adjacent parcels, Red Acre and Green Acre. She sells Green Acre to S for $200,000. Green Acre is divided by a deep canyon, which could be bridged at a cost of $75,000. The portion of Green Acre that adjoins Red Acre has no access to a public road. The other part of Green Acre adjoins a public road. A public road runs through Red Acre. Is S entitled to an easement by necessity across Red Acre to reach their land? To answer this, let's go back and take a look at the elements for easement by necessity. Remember, for an easement by necessity, a necessity, you need two elements. The first is that the severance of the title of land that's held in common ownership. So do we have that based on the, uh, on the fact pattern? Yes, we do. So the facts state that R owned both parcels and they severed title by conveying Green Acre. So we have common ownership. Okay. And the second element we're looking for is the necessity for the easement at the time of the severance. So when A severed the land, what did there become a necessity that arose from the severance? Well, to answer this question, um, you would need to determine which or how the jurisdiction defines necessity. And if you go to page 702 of your book, you will find uh, the, the different ways, different approaches that the jurisdictions can take. So if the jurisdiction follows the traditional approach, and this is the minority view now, then they would require strict necessity. So strict necessity, let's spell that right. Strict necessity is found only if there is no legal way for um, for them to to access the property. And in this case, S will likely not be able to meet that standard because S can reach their property from a, a public road. Now, if instead we use the reasonable necessity standard, which is what most courts use, necessity, come on pen, there we go, we use the reasonable necessity standard, then court would only require that the easement is beneficial or convenient for the use of the dominant parcel not that it needs to be absolutely or strictly necessary. And so S would likely be able to meet the necessity requirement if it's defined as reasonable necessity because S is unable to, um, to enjoy half of the land because they would need to construct an expensive bridge in order to do that. That wraps up that ex So we've reviewed the strict necessity and the reasonable necessity. What about Burge? Did they have a different, um, a different position? Or did they follow either the strict necessity or the reasonable necessity position? Now, Burge took a middle ground between strict and reasonable necessity. So they're about here. 
And their position was, quote, the lack of reasonably practical access. The lack of reasonably practical access. Now, I suspect that the Vermont court would find that there was a practical means for S to access the property because S can use the public road to access the property. What S's problem is, is that they can't enjoy all of their property once they've accessed it. But that's not part of the Vermont court's test. It's whether or not there is practical access to the land, reasonably practical access to the land. So, so it's, it's applying the Burge standard. It is, um, it is unlikely that us would be able to, to meet the element of necessity. For exam purposes, um, I'm just going to want you to worry about strict necessity and reasonable necessity. But I did want to note that the Burge test was a little bit different from those. So again, for exam purposes, I'll just be looking to see if you applied the traditional rule or the majority rule. All right, we're moving on to the next type of easement, and that's the prescriptive easement. So prescriptive easement is created when there is open, adverse, and continuous use over a statutory period of time. As you um, you may you may see that the elements are very similar to adverse possession. The following case that we're going to look at is really looking at the adverse and hostile element. And you may remember from adverse possession that courts differed as to whether they were interested in an objective standard, whether they use an objective standard or a subjective standard, whether they cared about actual bad faith or whether they required good faith. So the following case Focus, the court is focused on um, whether or not they should use the objective standard and just presume adversity if all of the elements have been, um, have been met or if something a little bit more is required, right? So let's talk about Odell v. Stiegel. So the plaintiff, Odell, purchased the house here. And this house had two driveways. So they had this horseshoe shaped driveway in the front. And then they had another driveway. And this here is a public road. This is the road at issue. So what's a little bit confusing about this case is that the defendants, the Steagles, they didn't own this gravel lane. What they had was an easement to use the gravel lane to access their home. Now, the Steagles objected to Odell's use of this gravel lane that they had an easement to. And so Odell sued, arguing that they had a prescriptive easement to access their home here because that is how they had accessed their home primarily. So Odell purchased the house in 2006, but they argued for tacking by noting that for several decades prior to 1999, there were visitors that used to use this path to get to this property because this used to be a church before it was the Odell's home. It used to be a church and the visitors used to use this land to access the church here. The trial court, the jury found for the Odells, and they found that they had a prescriptive easement. 
the opinion that we're reading is an opinion from the Supreme Court of Appeals, which is actually West Virginia's highest court. And they reversed the trial court's um, finding. So let's take a look at why. So the trial court found for Adele because they instructed the jury that as long as all of the other elements were met for the prescriptive easement, then adverse and hostile could be presumed. Well, the court rejected this. The Court of Appeals rejected this. And they argued that Odell did not meet the adverse and hostile element because Odell was unable to prove that they did not have the consent of the actual owners of the gravel lane, right? And so they could not show, excuse me, okay. they could not show the adverse and hostile element because while their use may have been open and notorious, may have been continuous, they were unable to show that, it was, that their use was adverse and hostile. Also, they were relying on tacking to meet the statutory period. And so to do that, the Odells would have had to show that the church visitors also uh, their use was adverse and hostile. And they didn't have any evidence to show that the church goers were not using the land with the consent of the actual owner. So as you can see, this case has some unusual facts where the owner was not actually named in the suit, the owner of this gravel road. So why was this included then? Look, According to the book authors, they felt that this um, this case did a really good job of uh, presenting the issue of adversity. Um, for our purposes, for the purposes of your exam, you're going to want to go through the same analysis um, on adverse and hostile as you would if it were an adverse possession case. So you're going to want to go over whether or not it was the objective standard where you can presume that if all of the other elements have been met, then it has been met as well. Or is it a subjective standard that requires either good faith or bad faith. Okay, so to make it kind of easier, simpler for our exam purposes, we're going to go ahead and use the same analysis that we would use if this was an adverse possession claim. Now for a thought question. If there is no evidence on the issue, should the court of law presume adversity or should they presume consent? when it comes to a claim for perspective easement. What do you think? The next type of easement we're going to discuss is an easement by estoppel. In some jurisdictions, they refer to it as an irrevocable license, but I'm going to refer to it by its more common name, which is an easement by estoppel. An easement by estoppel is a court-ordered easement that is created from a voluntary servitude after a person mistakenly believing the servitude to be permanent acted in a reasonable reliance on the mistaken belief. The key here is that there was reasonable reliance on the mistaken belief. Most courts require the following elements to find an easement by estoppel. Most courts require the following elements for an easement by estoppel. First, they require that the landowner allows another to use their land, thus creating a license. The second 
requirement is that the licensee relies on this license. And they usually make some type of physical improvement or incur significant costs because they believe that this license is permanent. And the final element is that the licensor knows or reasonably should expect that such reliance will occur. So those are the three elements that are required for a finding of an easement by estoppel. The facts of the case, uh, Kinzel v. Myers are as follows. So Van Duyen and Bauer uh, were friends. They owned houses that were adjacent to each other. They shared a, um, a, a border, a property line. And because they were out in the country, they did not have public utilities or public sewers. And so, all right, let's discuss the court's analysis. So first you might be wondering why the court didn't find that there was an express easement. Well, there was an agreement that they expressly agreed, the um, Van Dune and Bauer expressly agreed that Bauer could install the sewer line on, on the uh, Van Dune property. But that agreement is not enforceable as an express easement because it was not in writing and it violates the statute of frauds. So since we can't um, enforce the express easement, the court then needs to decide uh, if Kenzel's satisfy the elements of an easement by estoppel. And the court on page 714 sets out what those elements are. So those elements are that the owner permits another to use the land under circumstances in which it was reasonable to foresee that the user would substantially change position, believing that permission would not be revoked, and the user did substantially change the position in reasonable reliance on that belief. Okay, so in looking at whether or not Kinzel um, meet these requirements, so first, first off, we know that Van Duyen permitted Bauer to use the land for a sewer, so we meet the initial element of consent. We know that Bauer changed her position uh, by running the line through Van Duyen's property, so Bauer acted on Van Duyen's representation. Then three, we know that it was reasonable for Bauer to uh, assume that the easement was permanent or that the permission wouldn't be revoked. And four, there would be injustice that would result if the easement wasn't recognized because then Bauer's successors will need to install a new line. So because these elements have been met, the court found, uh, found for Kinzel and um, how that the owner would be stopped from denying an existence of an easement. Let's do an easement by estoppel exercise. Let's say P owned a large parcel of rural land that adjoined a lake. He developed a vacation home subdivision on the property and sold all the lots. But he retained title to the 100 foot wide strip of land between the houses and the lake. He and the other homeowners in the subdivision often crossed the strip in P's presence to swim in the lake. And he never objected. Without asking P's permission, A spends $5,000 for lumber to build a dock at the waterline, partly on P's land and partly onto the lake bed. As H begins construction, P walks past and smiles pleasantly. After the dock is finished, P fences off the 100-foot strip 
and posts a no trespassing sign and begins to use the new dock himself. Does H have an easement by estoppel or an irrevocable license? The answer is no. So H and the other owners could potentially argue for a prescriptive easement because if we can argue that adversity is presumed and the prescriptive period is met. But the facts don't support an easement by estoppel. And there are a few reasons why. The right to walk over the land has no connection to H's improvement on the property. So the construction of the dock can't be seen as reasonable reliance on, on um, the allowance of walking over the land. Right, so this pre-existing right to walk across the strip to reach the lake has no connection to the right to build um, on the dock. Well, what about P's smile? Could that be interpreted as giving H permission? Most likely no, because if you think about it, H had already bought the lumber and began um, building on the lakefront before seeing P's consent or P's smile. So the decision that H made to build on the dock wasn't based on reasonable reliance um, of a based on a belief that uh, P consented to, to the building of the dock. Next, we're gonna discuss a case that deals with interpreting easements. And that case is Marcus Cable Associates LP versus Crone. So in 1939, Crone's predecessors, they granted an easement to Hill County Electric Company to use the land for uh, electric transmission or a distribution line or system. So this Hill County Cooperatives installed a utility pool on the land and they put up some electricity cables. In 1991, the electric cooperative entered into a joint use agreement with a cable TV provider. And that agreement was later assigned to, the rights under that agreement was later assigned to Marcus Cable. Under that agreement, Marcus Cable would be allowed to attach cable lines to the electric company's existing poles. Um, so Marcus Cable su subsequently installed these uh, cable lines over the land of the Crones. Uh, seven years after they were installed, the Crones sued Marcus Cable for trespass and they sought an injunction to compel the removal of the lines. The trial court granted a summary judgment in favor of Marcus Cable and the Texas Court of Appeals reversed that decision. So we're, the case we're about to discuss is the Texas Supreme Court's ruling and it, they affirmed the Court of Appeals decision. The issue at the center of the case was whether or not an easement that was given uh, over private property with the purpose of constructing and maintaining electrical lines or cables could also be used for cable TV lines. And the court held that it is not, and it is not the same, um, it's not the same. So in this decision, 
the court talks about uh, that the common law rules allow that certain easements might be assigned or uh, apportioned to third parties, but that when it is assigned that the third party's rights to use that easement don't exceed the original owner's um, easement. And so to determine whether or not the cable use or running the cable lines would exceed the uh, original holder's ownership, the court uses principles of contract, contract interpretation. And they try to get at the contracting party's intentions. They also look at uh, plain, ordinary, generally accepted meaning. The court does uh, acknowledge that there is some flexibility in change over time for easements and that the manner, frequency, and intensity of an easement's use might change over time to accommodate technological development. But in order for that, um, that change to be accommodated, it has to fall within the purpose of the original easement. So the question then is, what was the purpose of the original easement in this case? The court opined that based on the language of the conveyance of the easement, the intention of the parties was to, to allow for the easement specifically to further the spread of electricity. And that other cases that were cited by Marcus Cable to justify their use, they were easements that were conveyed for the purpose of transmitting communication. So the court felt that transmitting communication is a broader uh, purpose than, than language that purports to further the spread of electricity. And so that was the justification for their decision. Let's try to apply this, um, this line of analysis to some express easement hypotheticals. So the first is seized land is benefited by an 1880 easement providing access for wagons across D Serbian land. Can C drive a car along the easement? Yes, you can. And that's because the purpose of the easement here was to provide access. Um, it, it was for transportation. So the common law allows for changes to accommodate technological developments, which would be going from a wagon to a car. But the purpose of the easement stays the same because both vehicles are used for transportation. Let's look at the next hypothetical. East land is benefited by an easement providing a right of way across F servient land. Can E install underground electric lines in the right of way? The answer here again is yes. Now, you may not have known this, but a right of way is a very uh, a broad, um, a broad expression, basically. So the right of way clauses, they permit the holder to install utilities, pipelines, and the like. And so electric lines would be within the scope of purpose. Now, you do have an argument for arguing that it would only apply to use above land as opposed to below the land. So I do think that the court might waver on that issue, but overall, um, the answer would likely be yes. All right, this video ends here. We will continue on with termination of easements next.